Presenting Faye Bainter and Ray Collins on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. Tonight's Cavalcade play is called Witness for the People and is brought to you by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. One of those better things is Speed Easy, the DuPont wall finish that is so easy to use over wallpaper or any other wall surface. It comes in 11 beautiful colors. One easy coat will cover soiled, dingy wallpaper, so your rooms will look bright and cheery again. Speed Easy is a cinch to use. You thin it with water and apply it with a large brush or roller. It dries in less than an hour. Speed Easy is made by DuPont. Good evening, friends. This is Walter Houston. Yesterday, I was telling a friend of mine who works on a newspaper about this evening's cavalcade play. I told him it was about a woman who fought to win freedom for the press. And he said, Walter, you should have put on that show last week. It would have been more appropriate then. It was Freedom of the Press Week. Well, frankly... I had to disagree with him because, to my way of thinking, a free press is something we ought to thank God for every day of every week in the year. Why do you suppose the Nazis made bonfires of the very same books you will find in the bookstore around the corner? Why do you suppose Japanese newspapers are forced to carry stories about successful Jap invasions of California? It's because tyrants are afraid of the power of a free press. So I say again... Our cavalcade play tonight is more than appropriate. It tells the exciting story of Anne Royal, a woman who helped our nation win its battle for freedom of the press. And now, the DuPont Company presents the talented and lovely Faye Bainter as Anne Royal with Ray Collins as President Andrew Jackson in Witness for the People. Some people laughed at Anne Royal. Some pretended not to hear. But everyone did hear all the same. It was even heard in the president's mansion. And there on a day early in spring, Andrew Jackson, seventh president of the United States, is talking to his secretary of war, John Eaton. I still think you ought to see her, Mr. President. By the eternal John, since when it has been the function of the Secretary of War to make appointments for me to see any old busybody who happens to run a printing press. Well, this isn't just any old busybody. This is Anne Royal. I don't care if it's the fellow who invented the printing press. I'm a busy man. But maybe she can help us. We've got the fight of our lives on our hands with this United States bank crowd, and, and as I've said before... The pen is mightier than the sword. What are you doing as Secretary of War, if that's what you think? Well, one doesn't have to choose between them, you know. I was talking to Mrs. Eaton about this woman. Peggy says she's a real power in Washington. And she's no fool, either. She knows what you're trying to do, and she believes in you. Peggy say that? Yeah, she did. The least you can do is see her. You waste enough time seeing politicians who want offices. Well, all right. Let her come in. I thought you were the president that anyone could see any time. Mistress Royal? Yes. Mind if I sit down? Oh, sit down by all means, ma'am. I'm as tired as a Mississippi mule tramping around these streets. Uh, I'll come in again later in the day, Mr. President. All right, John. Well, Mistress Royal, what can I do for you? What can you do for me? Did you ever hear of the power of the press? I know. The pen is mightier than the sword. Well, don't you believe it? Well, maybe I'm a little biased, ma'am. I'm a soldier. Well, I'm a printer, so we ought to get along famously. Now, General, you don't mind if I call you General, do you? Anything you wish, ma'am. I'm a printer, as I've said. A sort of one-woman newspaper, you might say. I suppose you've seen some of the broadsides I put out? I have, ma'am. Yes, and I can see you don't think much of them. Neither do I. And that's why I'm here. Well, you'll forgive me, ma'am, if I fail to see the connection. It's just this. The other day, I suddenly thought to myself, since Andrew Jackson moved to Washington, there are more important things happening here than courtships and scandals and all that kind of flapdoodle. And it's the duty of anyone who has anything to do with the printing press to find out about them and tell the people about them. And I thought the best place to find out was right here. 
You follow me? Yes, ma'am. Now, the big issue today is this United States bank business. What is it? Who's behind it? And why are you fighting it? Well, what are you going to do if I tell you? Print the truth about it. How do you know I'll tell you the truth? I don't. But I'll find out. Oh, that sounds fair enough. All right, I'll tell you. It's a simple story, an old familiar story, I'm afraid. The United States Bank controls the finances and the credit of the United States. It can issue money and withdraw it. It can cause panics and it can cause booms. The United States Treasury has to keep the government's money in that bank and pay for the privilege. And it's all owned by a few at the expense of many. You mean the government and the people don't have any say about it at all? Nary a say. Well, they ought to. That's what I say. And that's where the fight begins. Why can't Congress do something about it? They could. In fact, they're the only ones who can. Then why don't they? Well, you see, lately the bank's got in the habit of loaning money to congressmen. Do you mean to tell me there are congressmen who won't vote against the bank because they owe money to it? I can't prove that. But it wouldn't surprise me if it might have something to do with it. Well, of all the white-livered, thieving scoundrels, who are they? You know which ones are fighting me on this issue, don't you? I think I do. Look here, General. You haven't had much luck fighting these fellows with the sword, have you? The laws being what they are? No, ma'am. I have a feeling that when I get through, you'll begin to agree with me about the power of the pen. It'll have to be a mighty sharp pen, ma'am. It is, General. It is. Extra printing and Royal's latest paper all about the United States bank scandal. Penny of print, United States bank scandal. Penny of print, Penny of print. Mr. Speaker, I demand an immediate public investigation of the affairs of the United States Bank. We have lately heard charges against this institution in the public prints which, if true, indicate a threat to our freedom as great as any since the war for independence. This issue can no longer be called a political war. Any copies you want this time, Miss Royal? How many have you printed so far? Mm, about 1,500. Better run off another 500 or so if you're not too tired. We never seem to have enough nowadays. And you ought to get some sleep. I will, Sally. As soon as these are run off. 2,000 papers, then. It doesn't seem possible we'll sell them. We will, though. And wish we'd printed more. And listen. Who's that on the stairs? Sounds like visitors. Probably some idiot that got kicked by a horse and wants to be sure I printed it in the paper. Well, don't you knock when you enter a house, or do you always break in? Good evening, Mistress Royal. Who are you men, and what do you want? We've come to discuss a matter of business, Mistress Royal. Certain friends of ours are anxious to go into the printing business. Well, why don't they, if they have the wits to? They're particularly anxious to acquire this property of yours, this press and so on. Well, they can't have it. Good night. They're willing to pay very handsomely, provided you remain here as, uh, shall we say, manager. And uh, consult with them, of course, on the nature of your future publication. I thought so. What makes you think you can bribe me? Who do you think I am? One of their thieving politicians? You go back and tell your friends that I wouldn't touch such a filthy proposition, not if I was starving in the gutter. Now get out, all of you, get out. You refused, then? Refused? I not only refused, but I intend that the people of Washington shall know tomorrow morning why I have refused and what I have refused. Now clear out. All right, boys. Smash up that... What are you doing? Part of that paper. Just a minute. Just a minute. Look. She's, uh, she's got pistols. Indeed, I have got pistols. And I didn't grow up on the frontier without learning how to use them. Go ahead, boys. I'll handle this. One more step. Very well. That one's through your hat. The next one will be through your gizzard. Now get out. Uh, maybe we'd better. All right. Come on, boys. But I warn you, Anne Royal, that we're going to smash you if we have to buy the whole city of Washington to do it. 
The next time you call on me, watch out for skunk prep. How can a woman get out a newspaper with that going on all day and half the night? Now, Anne, I'm sure Mr. Sims and his folks mean all right. But why in the name of all that's frightful do they have to set up shop right under me? Well, Anne, worse things could happen. Nothing worse could happen. Anne, listen. They're coming up here. They are. They are. Bringing in the kids. What on earth do you idiots think you're doing? Sister Royal, we have come to save your soul. Save my soul? Get out of here while you can still save your skin. Now, no, Anne. sister, I see that we have come none too soon. We have heard grievous reports of late of your unbridled tongue. Listen, mister. I'm a hard-working, God-fearing woman who's trying to run a newspaper and serve her country as best she knows how. But I can stand only so much. And Down please. on your knees, sister. What? Down on your knees. Why? Here, help me, brother. Why, let go of me. Let go you of must, me. sister. Where's my umbrella? No! Why, you why, you why, headed you... Lord Brain Simpson. You hypocritical why, old you, buzzard. You heard me, you brother. You're a politician. You're a election stealer. Get out of here you before can't... I wrap this umbrella around your turkey neck. No. You've broken the law, Mrs. Royal. Do you hear me? You've broken the law. You're a witness, brother. You're Get out of here before I break your neck. So, you've had your turn all these months, Mrs. Royal. Now we're going to have ours. <laughs> The president will see you now, Mistress Royal. Thank you. Come in. Come in, Mistress Royal. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, it's a fine pickle you've got yourself into now. The United States versus Anne Royal. They tell me there's a warrant issued against you for being a common scold. Yes. I guess I walked right into the trap and slammed the door behind me. Common scold. I don't believe that charge has been used in 50 years. It's all trumped up. Something they dug up out of the Middle Ages, but it's still on the book. You think the bank crowd put this fellow Sims up to it, do you? I know it for a fact. Of course, I can't prove it. You know, between us, we've got that bank worried. Yes, but the trouble is, right now, they've got me worried. My trial comes up in three days, and you know what the legal penalty is if I'm convicted? Well, theoretically, it's the ducking stool. Yes, you're right. And they're building one right now down at the Navy. By the Eternal. Well, that's one thing I can do something about. I may not have much control over the United States Bank yet, but I surely do control the United States Navy. Oh, they're not going to use it. They just did that to scare me. But there are things they can do. Mistress Royal, you know that I'll do anything I can to help you. Now, what can I do? That's what I've come to talk to you about, General. Not because of any help I may have been to you in this fight against the bank. I'm in that fight because it's the plain duty of any honest journalist. Why I did come to you in this, they're going to try to shut down my press. And that makes it different. And they can do it. With fines, bonds to keep the peace, injunctions, yes, they can. And that makes it an attack not on me, but on the Constitution of the United States that guarantees a free press in this country. That's why I've come to you. By the eternal... Why, I'll go down to that courtroom and I'll tell those scoundrelly sea lawyers... No, no, no. You're going down there would do more harm than good. But maybe you could just let the court know somehow that... Well, you know Anne Royal. And that you know she's an honest, truthful woman. You can depend on that. I've got a little ammunition of my own. But it's you I'll count on most. I... I don't know how I'll do it, ma'am. But one thing you can be sure of... I will do it. You are listening to Faye Bainter and Ray Collins in Witness for the People on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Back in 1830, Fiery Ann Royal published a penny newspaper that exposed a national scandal. Naturally, there were those who realized it would be to their advantage to keep her quiet. But as our story now reveals... Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Federal Court of 
the District of Columbia is now in session. Oh, Anne, I'm scared. I don't feel too chipper myself. Look at that jury. Every one of them is hooked up with the bank some way. The clerk will call the first case. The case of the United States versus Anne Royal. The defendant is charged by the people of the United States with being a common disturber of the peace, a common brawler, and a common scold. How does the defendant plead? What do you think I plead to such nonsense? Not guilty. Please, Mistress Royal, as your attorney, I... Order in the court. The prosecutor will call the first witness. <clears throat> Mr. Alexander Sims to the stand. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God? I do. Uh, Mr. Sims, you are a minister of the gospel, are you not? I am. He's no more a minister than I am. <laughs> Order! Mistress Royal, I must caution you against such outbursts in this court. Uh, proceed, Mr. Swan. Uh, uh, and on the day of the war on charges, you visited Mistress Royal with certain others at the place of her business. Did you not? I did. And was it at that time that she used the vile and abusive language of which you complain? Indeed it was, sir. What did she say? Well... I... Go on, go on, tell them. They'll see that much is true anyway. <laughs> Mistress Royal. Well, she said I was a, 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 a large brain simpleton and a, a, hip, a hypocritical old buzzard. <laughs> and a pumpkin headed, penny filching collection stealer. Please, please, Mistress Royal. The defendant must not interrupt the testimony. Uh, that will be all, Mr. Simmons. Does the defense wish to cross-examine? Go on, go on. Ask him what I told you to. But, Mistress Royal, it's not admissible as evidence. Well, then I'll ask him. Oh. Acting as my own attorney, Your Honor, I'd like to ask the witness just one question. Proceed, Mistress Royal. Mr. Sims, did you, or didn't you, recently acquire five shares of stock in the United States Bank? Why, yes. What I... I object. Was... The question is completely irrelevant to the indictment. Objection sustained. Irrelevant, is it? I suppose it's irrelevant that you, Your Honor, were loaned $10,000 by the United States Bank the day before this trial opened. <laughs> Mistress Royal, one more such outburst, and I shall hold you in contempt of court. But it's true. And you may hold me in contempt of court if you like. For I have the most complete contempt for this court and everything it stands for. Mr. Prosecutor, have you any further witnesses to call against Anne Royal? No, Your Honor, I haven't. The prosecution rests. The defense may call its first witness. <coughs> Uh, Your Honor, Sit down. I... Sit down. I'll handle this. Your Honor, there's just one witness I should like to call in my own defense if he is present. And that is Mr. John Eaton, the Secretary of War. Mistress Royal, I must remind you again that a court of law is no place for idle pleasantry. This is no pleasantry, Your Honor. Sally, where is he? I don't know. Where. Is Mr. John Eaton here? If you will proceed with your defense, Mistress Royal. One moment, Your Honor. Sally. Why, it's old Eaton himself. What do you think? The Secretary of War. I knew he wouldn't say it. He's here, Sally. Mr. Secretary, do I understand that you are here to testify on behalf of this defendant? I am. We are honored, I assure you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, will you take the stand, please? Certainly. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Proceed, Mr. Eaton. Your Honor, what I have to say will not take long. I come here to speak on behalf of the defendant, Anne Royal, as her friend. I have known Mistress Royal for many years. And whatever her faults, I know her to have one virtue which far overbalances any faults. I know that when Anne Royal speaks, she speaks the truth, openly and fearlessly. It is my sincere hope, gentlemen, this fact may be not without influence in your judgment of this case. Oh, Anne, wasn't it wonderful? Sally, I don't care now if they send me to jail for life. They can't convict you now. Oh, yes, they can. It's not what they hear, but what they get that influences those gentlemen. 
Does the defence have anything additional to add? Just a word to the jury, Your Honour, if I may. Proceed. Gentlemen of the jury, I know what you think of me. I know it's useless to appeal to your chivalry or any of that nonsense. But one thing I must say to you. This is a trumped-up charge. It was brought to close my newspaper. Remember that when you render your verdict. And one thing else, remember. There is a document called the Constitution of the United States. The First Amendment to that document guarantees as the foremost privilege of Americans the freedom of speech and of the press. Remember this, gentlemen of the jury. And while you are pondering what vengeance you will wreak upon Anne Royal, ponder also, if you attack your constitution, what vengeance posterity may wreak upon you. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. I'll find you the defendant, Anne Royal. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Anne, you must try to rest. Haven't I been resting? No, dear. You've got a little fever from the excitement of the trial and all. What time is it? It's late. It's almost midnight. I suppose in the morning they'll come to take the press away. Take the furniture too, most likely. What are we going to do, Anne? I don't know. We'll get along somehow. Always have. I don't see how they could have done it to you. And after what Mr. Eaton said. He did his best. It was money that did it. Money to buy judges and juries. But to fine you so much when they knew you couldn't pay. That's what they got me up there for. To shut me up. Looks like they've just about done it, too. Tomorrow they'll take the press. And there's someone on the stairs. You don't suppose they'd come for it tonight, do you? Open the door, Sally. Good evening, Mistress Royal. Why, General. I'm... I'm sorry it's so late. There was a cabinet meeting. I came as soon as I could. General, Mr. President, you didn't have to come to me. I heard what happened. I just wanted to tell you that your fine was paid. Some folks that uh, were grateful for what you'd done. Yes, uh, they got up the money. You don't owe me that, General. I thought you'd want to know that now they can't attach any of your property. Take your press or anything. Thank you. And by the way, you know I think we finally got that bank crowd licked. Have you? Yeah. Talking to some of the boys this evening. Oh, it's going to take time, of course. But we've got them. I'm glad. I thought you'd be. You know, General, I've been kind of sassy to you sometimes. Considering you're president of the United States. Why, I don't recollect it, ma'am. I have, though. But you know, it's just my way. I know, I know. And, General, now that you've found me in a weak moment, I just want you to know that old Anne Royal thinks you're a really great man. Folks will remember you, General, for a long time. Why... Thank you, Mistress Royal. I think folks will remember you, too. Our thanks to you, Faye Bader. Ray Collins, and to all other members of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade.
You know, when a plane has to make a forced landing, it's bad any time. But to be forced down in the Pacific is particularly tough because you're either at sea or in dense jungle, to which you must hack your way back to safety. While flyers are supplied with combat emergency rations, like other soldiers on active duty, they sometimes have to live off the land and kill small game for food when they're forced down. The only gun a flyer can carry when he bails out, crash lands on water or jungle, is a pistol. Gain Whitman has some interesting facts for you about special ammunition for these pistols. The Remington Arms Company, a DuPont affiliate, has developed a special pistol cartridge just for the purpose Mr. Houston just mentioned, to kill small game for food. Ordinarily, as you know, a pistol shoots a solid bullet. The new ammunition developed by Remington Arms is a cartridge which shoots more than a hundred shot pellets. Tests by Remington's technical division show that the new caliber 45 cartridge puts an average of more than half of these pellets into a 30-inch circle at a distance of 40 feet. It is the first cartridge of this caliber and type to be developed. The case is of brass with a thin waterproof top wad held in place by crimping. The cartridge is a little longer than the regulation caliber 45 combat cartridge because extra space is needed for a heavy powder charge for killing small game. For that reason, it must be fired one shot at a time because the cartridge is too long to fit into the clip magazine of the pistol. That's good, though, because a man can shoot an animal or bird for food and then quickly snap the magazine loaded with regular cartridges back into his gun so as to be ready for anything that might happen. A Japanese sniper, for instance. The new cartridges offer a better chance of survival to a flyer adrift at sea, too, because seagulls and other overwater birds can be brought down with them. Every flyer's jungle kit now contains two waterproofed boxes of these new shot cartridges developed by the Remington Arms Company. As a result of long experience, Remington Arms makes the right ammunition for every kind of game and every make of gun. And now here is Walter Houston. Uh, next week to Pont Cavalcade is the authentic story of a girl you may know. She may have been your next-door neighbor, the girl who left your town to go overseas with the Red Cross as a clubmobile girl. She probably told you that her work was to laugh and joke with the men to make them forget about the war. Well, she left this country and was assigned to an air base in New Guinea. And there she found the work of a clubmobile girl who was not only laughing and joking with the men, was not only serving donuts, coffee, and bug juice to the men at the end of their missions, but more. She found that she had become an important non-combat member of a team of American young men and women fighting this war. Listen with us to this exciting and moving story of the American Red Cross Club Mobile Workers next Monday evening when we present the lovely and talented Lana Turner in Donut Girl. Thank you and good evening. Bainter, star of tonight's cavalcade, is currently working in the Paramount picture, The Virginian. Ray Collins will soon be seen in Universal's Can't Help Singing. The music on tonight's cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Ombrister. This is Gain Whitman inviting you to tune in next week to Donut Girl, starring Lana Turner, brought to you by the E.I. DuPont de Nemours Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.